So in this video, I'm going to be giving you guys an overview of Ableton's operator. Um, Ableton, uh, or the operator, is one of the built-in synthesizer devices that comes with Ableton Live Suite. It can be found by going to the browser, instruments, and then operator. If we expand out the folder, we can see a whole bunch of different presets for operator. And I want to remind you guys that there are several different, or there are two types of presets for Ableton Live devices and instruments. The first being the .adv, and the second being the .adg. If I load up one of the .advs, we'll see that it gives us just the single operator window. If I load up instead one of the .adgs, just by dragging and dropping onto the track or double clicking, you'll see that it loads up um, the operator in here, but along with other things. Um, so uh, when you're just getting familiar with operator for the first time, I recommend staying away from the .adg presets and sticking with the .adv presets simply so that you don't get lost or confused uh, through the addition of several other audio effects or MIDI effects that might be altering or changing the sound. Um, and sticking with the .advs will allow you to focus in on what sounds the operator is capable of producing. So with that said, let's go back to the browser, add just the default operator by clicking and dragging the operator uh, main folder there to a MIDI track. I could also double click on it, it will add it to whatever track I want, or I could drag and drop it over an empty, empty slot in my session view or my arrangement view. It'll create a new MIDI track with the operator already loaded onto it. So to give you a tour of the user interface, the operator can be broken down into nine sections. This shell containing the first eight where we've got four oscillators on the left-hand side. And over the right-hand side, we have our LFO section, filter section, pitch section, and global parameters. And as you can see, as I've clicked on each one of these eight sections, the ninth section being the center window here updates with further parameters or controls um, so we can get into the nitty-gritty details of each of these sections. So that's kind of the lay of the land. We could also hide this middle window just by clicking on this arrow here and it'll collapse it down so we're only looking at the shell rather than the details view. Um, but for the most part you're going to want to keep open the details view because you're going to be spending a lot of time working with these details in the middle here. So let's start with talking about um, the different types of synthesis that Operator enables us to do, because it's rather a complex synthesizer, but understanding Operator um, will allow you to then look at other synthesizers that are even more complex and understand them based upon the shared similarities, um, but also the shared basics, because Operator is a really basic form of synthesis or provides us with really basic forms of synthesis. So understanding those modes will really be beneficial to you as you go on to deal with other types of um, synthesizers, software synthesizers, or hardware synthesizers. So let's start with taking a look at these four oscillators. Each of these four oscillators are exactly the same. On the shell portion here, we see the tuning controls, coarse and fine, and this controls based upon MIDI input, what note do we actually get? Um, so if I play in a C3, oops, let's record and able to track here, play in a C3, we get the resulting frequency of the anticipated C3. But if I change the course knob to two, you'll hear we get the octave above. Even though I triggered it with the same C3, I've changed the way that operator responds to that incoming MIDI note by saying, give me that note, but times two. Or I could do times three, which is gonna give me an octave and a fifth above that, or times four, two octaves up. But this enables us to control um, which frequency results from the incoming MIDI note. I can also do 0 0.5, the octave below. Let's go back to one just by clicking on that dial and hitting our delete key. If I go over to the fine control and I sustain a note, you'll hear that this gives me much finer control over the octaves. So the next button is fixed or unfixed. If I click on that, now we're specifying, regardless of what MIDI note we receive, the frequency that we're going to result in. So right now we're going to get 100 hertz. I can tune that down, tune that up, hit the delete key to go back to 100 hertz, and then the multi or the multiplier of that specified frequency. So right now we're taking 100 times 1, which is going to give us 100. If I do 100 times 0 0.1, we'll get 10, which we can't hear coming through our headphones or our computer speakers, but I could also do times 10. 
get a thousand, but let's go back to one. So that's just similar to the course control in the MIDI mode, but in the fixed mode, it's multiplying the frequency that we specified here. The last parameter is the level, and this controls the output amplitude of the oscillator in terms of decibels. So as I sustain a note, let's go back to the MIDI mode, turn it down, or turn it up. This will also, you'll see when we get to how these oscillators can interact, you'll see that this will also be not just the output, but also the potential effect that an oscillator can have on another oscillator, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, looking now into the details view, we have two main views for each of these four oscillators on the left-hand side. We have the envelope view, which allows me to specify the amplitude envelope of each of these oscillators independently, so I can give it a longer attack by clicking and dragging out here, adjust its sustain and a decay time by dragging the third uh, square there, and its release time. And notice that in all the numbers below, we can see attack, decay, sustain, and release updating with the, uh, the mouse dragging on the display there in the middle. So that's where I can uh, specify control values. You can see there's, or I'm sorry, envelope uh, capabilities. You can see we can also stretch or compress time in relationship to the velocity of the incoming note. We can scale the amplitude based upon the incoming velocity. So this envelope can either have greater or lesser effect based upon the velocity. So in most case scenarios, you're gonna to wanna to adjust this up to some extent so that it has some sympathy to incoming velocity. And we can also um, have it sympathetic to key that's incoming. So a lower note will have a shorter um, or higher amplitude envelope dependent upon how we set this. Um, most of the time I leave this set at 0%. It's not very intuitive to me to think about a lower note having a lesser volume than a higher note, so on and so forth. Um, so I generally leave that one alone. And then over from there, we have the looping, where we can loop this envelope in relationship to either time. So this envelope would now repeat every 100 milliseconds, or we could adjust that, or beat, to now this envelope is gonna repeat at a certain beat value. Sync, same thing, it's going to synchronize to our master tempo um, at a certain beat value, or trigger, only whenever we trigger it, with an incoming MIDI note. Um, this can be useful if you're creating like a um, bass type sound and you want to get the repeating of a note like doom, 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 type sound of that doom, doom, repetitive note. You could use the beat or the sync to get that type of result happening. Um, if um, we then switch from the envelope view to the oscillator view, we encounter the first um, type of synthesis that opera, operator enables us to do, and that's what is called additive synthesis. Simply put, that's just taking um, either simple or complex sounds and adding them together to create a new, even more complex sound. Um, inside of operator in each of these oscillators, uh, we do additive synthesis through the addition of sine tones in the harmonic series. So the harmonic series is um, notes above a fundamental that are related by um, most commonly uh, whole number integers. So if we look at um, our sine tone here, we can see a visualization of the waveform that's going to result from this additive synthesis. A sine tone has just the fundamental frequency. So I can adjust the amplitude of this fundamental frequency by sustain a note and clicking and dragging up or down. Let's go adjust our envelope so we don't have anything decaying right away. There we go, back to the oscillator view. But now I can add in the next harmonic. Why are you, oh, because we've got it set to trigger two. Let's go none. Now we could add in the next harmonic. Next harmonic. on up. So now we've got all of the first 64 partials all at equal amplitude. Um, and so these partials or harmonics are related by whole number integers. So if we take whatever our first fundamental is, let's set this to 100. So in fixed mode now, and I add in the second harmonic, we're now getting a frequency at the same amplitude 
but twice the relationship of that 100 hertz. So this is going to be a 200 hertz uh, sine tone. So if I add in the EQ8 here from our audio effects so we can visualize that, expand this out, collapse our browser. Let's start with just seeing that 100 hertz. And we can see, looking in the bottom corner of the um, spectral view here, we can see that we've got, there's our 100 hertz, happens to be a G1. Now as I add in that second partial, you can see now there's our 200 hertz. And the third partial, 100 times 3, 300 hertz. 100 times 4, 400 hertz. 100 times 5, 500 hertz, so on and so forth up to the 64th partial. So all of these are adding in additional sine tones into the oscillator, creating um, more complex tones from a simple tone. And we can again see here the resulting waveform, so the amplitude output of this oscillator um, that's going to be passed along for further processing. So that's additive synthesis. We can also select these types of um, harmonic relationships by choosing basic waveforms. So if we choose a sine tone, you can see that a sine tone has just a fundamental frequency. If I go to a SAW 64, which just means that we're going to have 64 partials versus SAW 3, which is just going to have three partials. If I go to SAW 64, you can see that a SAW wave, um, unlike a sine wave, has all partials but just gradually getting quieter and quieter as we get up in amplitude. Where if I instead switch to a square 64, we'll see that a square is like a saw, but instead only has the odd partials or odd harmonics. So we have one, the fundamental, uh, then we'd skip two, then we get three, then we skip four, we get five, so on and so forth all the way up. So the only difference between a square wave and a saw wave is the missing even partials. And if we listen to that, let's start with the saw 64 versus the square 64. You can hear that the square has a little bit more of a plastic sound or a hollow sound, um, whereas the saw has a much more richer, fuller sound. Uh, we can also use a triangle which is similar to a square wave but just drops off much more rapidly. We don't have all 64 partials. And then finally, noise, which will give us no display because it's just random white noise like this. Awful. But could be useful, especially when designing um, percussive sounds. We might use a really short envelope on a white noise, something like this, for a hi-hat sound. So this would make a great hi-hat sound, especially if I beat repeat this. And if I've got a keyboard that enables velocity input, or after touch, we could then create a really cool pattern just by repeating this over and over again, making it shorter or longer. So those are our basic waveform types, sine, saw, square, triangle, and noise. Um, you'll see it jumps to user anytime I start to draw in my own. That just means I'm defining my own waveform. So that's additive synthesis, this process of building up a complex, ta complex tone from a simple tone. And each of these four oscillators has all of these capabilities. So if I look at each of these, I can draw in their own waveforms, their own envelopes, um, and their own relationships to the incoming MIDI note. I can click on their letters here, A, B, C, or D, to turn them on or off. Um, and uh, one last thing that I want to show is phase. So if I jump back to this sine tone here for oscillator A, and I adjust the phase down here, and you look at this little visualizer right here, you can see that we're adjusting the start point um, within the waveform that this will trigger. And this will make a difference when we get to how these oscillators um, can interact with each other. So let's progress on to the rest of the shell. Um, all four of those oscillators, A, B, C, and D, all have the same capabilities that envelope and that additive synthesis process. We also have the LFO over here, which we've already discussed in previous videos about um, the simpler instrument. An LFO just stands for low frequency oscillator, and I can use it to control 
um, or modulate parameters within operator. So if I enable it by clicking on the button here, I can select what type of waveform its shape will be as it produces um, or as it modulates things. So I can leave it at sine tone. Then I can switch um, what range of, excuse me, rate or frequency do I want to use, low, high, or synchronized. So if I go to synchronized, I can specify its rate in relationship to the beat. Then retrigger, will the LFO retrigger with every new incoming MIDI note, or will it go continuous? Um, and then finally, the, the overall amount of effect that it has on whatever parameters it's modulating. We can use the LFO to modulate the frequencies of any of the four oscillators by turning these on or off. So if I have it modulating the frequency, let's go back to low, the frequency of oscillator A, which is at 100 hertz right now, and I start to bring up its amount. Let's first trigger a note. We've got it synchronized. Let's go back over here. Let's go none, and there we go. So now we've got our sustaining 100 hertz. Back to our LFO, which is destination A, is going to the frequency of oscillator A. I start to bring up the amount, watching both the EQ8 waveform and also listening with your ears. Listen for this effect. Slowing that down. And we see that frequency that's being produced by oscillator A is no longer steady at 100 hertz, but rather it's moving up and down at the rate specified by our LFO. So we could do that to all four oscillators. Um, or we could also turn it off to oscillator A by clicking on there and route it to the filter. So let's get a saw wave here so we've got a little bit more complex tone to work with. And then let's jump to the filter section, which we can have in any of these types of filters, which we've already encountered, and reduce that frequency. And then, as you can see here, it's turned on or off for the LFO to modulate that filter. Let's increase the resonance so we can really hear it. Increase the rate. So that's the LFO. We can route it either to destination A, which is either the frequencies of oscillators A, B, C, or D, or the frequency of filter A. Then we can also route it to a second destination. Um, the oscillator's volumes, the crossfades, feedbacks, um, quite a few parameters in here that we can move or we can modulate with the LFO. So try experimenting with all of them and try and use your ears to figure out what's happening, what parameter might it be modulating, how is that affecting the overall sound, so on and so forth. Uh, the LFO can have an envelope, so we can have it have no effect at the beginning or we could flip it and have lots of effect at the beginning and then it dips out and then a little bit of effect and then at the end here it goes back to having lots of effects. So this envelope is totally manipulatable and when and how much effect the LFO has on its destination A or destination B. And we can further specify that um, down here. Time can be attached to velocity. We could loop this one as well. Um, this is just a number representation of the envelope down at the top there. Um, rate can be attached to key, amplitude could be attached to, or amount could be attached to velocity. So further details on how our LFO behaves. Filter section, we've already got a little bit of a look at that. Um, it, if I switch over to its filter view, we can see the filter shape that we're working with here. It's just a single filter. So we can go band, high, notch, and then resonance, frequency, or we could specify that here by dragging this up or down, left or right. Um, this can also be attached to velocity or key, or we can turn over to its envelope and specify an envelope for when this filter will take effect in relationship to the start and end of notes. So that's the filter section. Should be fairly familiar at this point, but just a little bit nicer visualization of envelopes. The second or the seventh section here is the um, pitch envelope section here. And this is where I can specify the pitch envelope by turning it on, just like in Simpler. 
I can attach this um, to any of the oscillators or the LFO, which can be kind of interesting. Let's start with oscillator A. We're turning off all the other destinations. Then let's give it a really steep attack and bring this down, something like that. And then let's increase the pitch envelopes percentage. Let's increase the attack time. Cool, let's turn off our filter and our LFO. And let's go over here and let's turn this into a sine wave. So oscillator A is now a sine wave. So we're just manipulating the frequency of oscillator A's sine tone with our pitch envelope here. And I'm gonna turn this into a kick sound. So let's reduce the frequency first, turning off our pitch envelope. So if you've got a good pair of headphones on, you should be able to hear this. If you don't, I recommend you do, so you can hear low frequencies like this. Right now we're operating at 40 hertz. I'm just wearing my Apple, uh, Apple headphones and they work just great for this. So let's turn on the pitch envelope, going back to 0% and gradually bringing it up here. Cool, then let's start to decrease that attack time. Cool, then let's go back to our envelope for oscillator A and let's get rid of that sustain. Maybe decrease the frequency a little bit. Cool, so that can be a, a great way to make a kick sound. If I switch over to being MIDI input here and I go 0.5. Let's go down a couple octaves. We can really get that old school 808 or 909 sound by using pitch enveloping on a sine tone here. So lots of potential sounds we can get out of this. So that's the pitch envelope. Next section over there we've got spread. Just like in Simpler we can shift or detune and or um, uptune the left and the right channels to get a little bit wider sound. This sounds really nice if I switch this over to being a saw wave. Let's go saw, add a little bit of filtering on it, and let's get rid of that pitch envelope by clicking on it, hitting delete, and then let's start to increase the, what's our envelope like over here? Let's get that envelope back, get back up the octaves, open up that filter a little bit, then let's increase the spread. So that can sound really nice on, on really bright sounds like that, increasing that spread. Then we have some global transposition where I can affect the transposition of the output note by manipulating that knob. Most case scenarios, I don't touch that knob. Um, I like my synthesizers to give me exactly the note that I put in, so I'm not going to change that at all. The last section here is where things start to get interesting. So first of all, we have the ability to map um, other, um, other messages that can be contained in our MIDI message, so first velocity or key. But we could also have aftertouch, which is um, once I've, um, when I'm sustaining a note on my MIDI keyboard, do I press it in harder or softer? And not all MIDI keyboards have this capability, but some do. Um, so I can map the aftertouch to modulate parameters within my operator. And then next to that, I control how much it controls it. So for example, I could go velocity, and I want to map that to my um, LFO rate or filter resonance or um, any parameter that I want to, and then increase the amount that's happening there. I could also have a second connection for that same parameter and an amount for that. Then key can be mapped to two parameters, aftertouch two parameters, pitch bend, how much effect does it have? Um, pitch bend is um, one of two wheels that might be found on your MIDI's, in, uh, MIDI's keyboard, MIDI keyboard. Then mod wheel, the second wheel that's on there could be also mapped somewhere else. Um, how many voices is operator capable of producing at one time? When we run out of voices or we play simultaneous voices, um, do we re-trigger um, the same note? 
just like in simpler do we re-trigger the same note when we play it over and over again or do we use more voices to produce um, duplicates or triplicates of that same note um, but what I want to talk about now is these algorithms here so these colored boxes that we have across the top here and what these color boxes control is how operator is connected or how the four oscillators within operator are interacting or connected. So as they're interacting right now, the output from oscillator D is routed to oscillator C's frequency control. So we could think of the signal that is being created. So right now it's just a sine tone at whatever MIDI note we put in there, at whatever level we put in there. That output is acting as an LFO, but um, in this case, it's no longer a low frequency oscillator, but rather a high frequency oscillator. Um, but it's acting the same way that an LFO does, but it's routed rather than going to the output of, os of operator, it's routed to the frequency control of oscillator C. And then the output of that of oscillator C being modulated by oscillator D is output to oscillator B, and then the results of oscillator B being modulated by um, oscillator C signal, which has been modulated by oscillator D signal, is output to oscillator A's frequency control, and then the results of all three stages of that um, modulation is output to operator's output. So let's start with just listening to how oscillator B can modulate oscillator A. If I leave the two, let's go back to one, and I'm going to switch oscillator B into fixed mode. Let's bring it down to 10 hertz and then multiply it by 0 0.1. So now oscillator B is going to be oscillating at 1 hertz at a sine tone. And let's put oscillator A back to a sine tone. And then as I start to increase the amplitude of oscillator B, we're going to hear that same effect that we heard earlier when we had the LFO modulating the frequency of A. But this time we've got the output of oscillator B modulating the frequency of oscillator A. So let's listen. Oop, we've got, this, we've got the spread still on. Let's take off that spread. Just get rid of that and the filter altogether. So we're only listening to the interaction that's happening here. Now I'm going to bring up the amplitude of oscillator B. Notice we've still got the frequency that's being produced by oscillator A totally still. And as I start to increase the amplitude or the level of oscillator B, you can hear and see it starting to destabilize as oscillator B's output gets louder and louder. We can now see that we've got the amplitude, or sorry, the frequency of oscillator A is now moving up or down one time a second based upon the output of oscillator B. As I start to increase the frequency of oscillator B, we'll see that this starts to move more and ra more rapidly. So it's moving back and forth at the rate Then decreasing the amplitude, we get back to totally still tone. So we can then have this modulation or that same mode of mo modulation happening between all four oscillators, creating super complex um, sounds as a result of those modes of, of modulation. So um, to review the types of synthesis that we've covered so far within operator, we started with editing the oscillators harmonic series, which we called additive synthesis, this process of adding um, single or simple tones together to make more complex tones. Then we moved into frequency modulation, which is this relationship between the output of one oscillator being connected to the frequency control of another oscillator. So we've got additive synthesis and then frequency modulation. Um, then the final mode, which we've actually already talked about, but we've never given it a name is called subtractive synthesis and that's accomplished through filtering. So I build up a complex tone. Let's bring in oscillator C as well. Wicked, let's retune it a little bit. 
Oscillator D. So we've got a complex tone. And then if I bring in my filter, we can use subtractive synthesis by using the filter. to subtract from our sound, to focus or shape our sound into what I want it to be. So we've got additive synthesis, frequency modulation, and subtractive synthesis. That's the basics of operator. Um, we could spend the entire uh, duration of your uh, college education talking about styles or approaches or the types of sounds that we can create through these modes of synthesis. But I think at this point it's time for you to just dive in, start messing around with these parameters. So I want to point out some techniques or places you can go to learn more about Operator. Great place to start is just by digging through the presets, by either going to the browser, instruments, expanding these out. And again, I recommend that you stick with the .adgs rather than the .advs. Um, then you can also get to that same preset place by hitting the hot swap button in operator just to the right corner over here so clicking on that that'll bring up the um, presets for this and I can use my computer's keyboard to toggle through and listen to them and if I like this sound I can just hit my return key which will switch that sound into the operator spot here and I can go through and look at how that sound has been shaped or created using um, using the parameters within operator. So I can continue to do that. Um, one uh, great uh, study that I've done several times is I'll load up two operators. Uh, so I'll go, let's get out of hot swap mode, I'll go to my instruments, grab a default operator, put it on one track, then I will dump the sound or the preset of the operator that I like on the other track. And then I will go back and forth looking at this one, starting with the first oscillator here. This one is set to three, I'll jump back to my default operator, listen to what it sounds like when I input a note. Oops, let's switch my chord arm back to the first operator track. How does changing that dial to three alter the sound? I heard that it raised the sound um, by a specific relationship. And I would go back over to the sound that I'm trying to create. I see that fine is set to zero, fixed is off, and level is set to negative 6.7 decibels. So let's bring this down, negative 6.7 decibels. I heard that reduced the output volume of oscillator A a little bit. Then I would proceed through each of these oscillators, checking out the details view to make sure that those map up and using my ears to listen as I change those parameters, trying to diagnose um, how that parameter um, is affecting the output sound of operator. While this is quite tedious, this is really a great way to get familiar with uh, the sound possibilities and all the parameters and controls within Operator, especially if you take the time to explore and to cue your ear in on how that is affecting the sound. So I would really recommend doing this for those of you that really want to get into synthesis. This is a great way to do it. It's the same as if you're a guitar player of sitting down and trying to figure out how to play your favorite guitarist guitar solo by playing a little bit of their track and trying to find the right notes on your guitar. It's really the, the best way to, to dive into this. Um, if you're more of a um, text learner person rather than an ear learner, you like to conceptualize first and then make connections with what you're actually hearing or doing in the real world, I'd recommend going to the help view by going to view, help view. Then if I go down here to the bottom, if I don't see this view, I can just click on the home button, which will bring me back to this page. Now if I go down here to all built-in lessons, and then from there I go down near the bottom, you'll see this operator section, creating sounds with operator synthesizer. We've got several built-in lessons that will walk me step-by-step step through first giving me an introduction to operator, which I highly recommend you guys all do, um, and then how to create several different types of sounds using operators. And again, this is gonna be really useful in this project that you guys are all working on in discovering how you can use operator to build sounds to be used in your track. So if I open up this introducing operator, you'll see it gives me a short introduction here. The note, this lesson is accompanied with a live set, which you'll be interacting with as you follow the lesson. Please kick, click here to load the set. If I click on that, it's gonna ask me, do I wanna save what I'm currently working on? I'm gonna say no in these circumstances because um, 
what I've got uh, is just to show you guys. So don't save, and it's going to load up a set with a default or nearly default operator in there that I'm going to be working with as I progress through these lessons. So it's going to give me a tour, basically what I just gave you guys. Um, but if you're more of a text learner, this will give you some more basic information that you can reference or think about as you're starting to craft your sound. So I definitely recommend you guys go through all of these uh, operator built-in lessons. It'll just really solidify what we've been talking about here. <clears throat> the final place, um, again, for you text learners would be to go to the live manual, read the live manual, which I'm gonna ask you guys to all do anyways. I can either read this here on my uh, um, computer or I could go to Ableton's website and load that up as well. If I scroll down here to, um, let's see, there should be an instrument section routing, mixing, recording, um, working with instruments, instruments, drums. Uh, where are you? Here we go, operator section, chapter 24.6, click on that. And here is the section of the manual devoted to talking about the operator. So this is another great resource for coming and learning about it. Final resource would be to check out YouTube videos um, that cover operator. Again, take these all with a grain of salt. Some are taught by professionals that really know what they're talking about. Um, others are taught by people that are really talented, um, but not necessarily explaining things properly. So this YouTube can be a great resource for um, getting new ideas, um, but I caution you for using it as, as hard evidence or um, reliable sources for the actual concepts underneath them, because sometimes people misspeak um, or represent things improperly. Um, so that's Operator, great sound possibilities, um, additive synthesis, frequency modulation, subtractive synthesis, and then everything else should be as we've seen already. So hope this helps. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions, and I'll see you guys all on Tuesday. Bye.